All right, so um, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody uh, this morning, um, and I guess it's uh, later on in the afternoon in other parts of the world. Um, Dr. Sally al Masashi will be uh, joining us today for the PCC round. He's going to be talking about DEL complications and outcomes. Uh, I want to thank Sally for your uh, time that you're spending with us today. Uh, for those who um, have not met Sally, he's a very uh, entertaining uh, gentleman. Uh, always got lots of ideas, always quick to laugh. Um, he did his residency at McGill University. Uh, and then went on to do his fellowship training at the University of Montreal in cornea and refractive surgery. And then from there on went into Sheikh Khalifa Medical City and where he did a few things that were really kind of demonstrate his leadership and his passion for what he does. He uh, started up the uh, residency program there as well as the iBank uh, program. And uh, then recently has, is more involved with the Samaya Eye Hospital where he's a partner and, and um, working very actively in cornea and refractive surgery. And in addition to all that, he is a, the president of the Emirates Society of Ophthalmology and they host some very interesting conferences every year. So uh, without further delay, uh, Sally, I'm so happy you're able to um, accept our invitation to uh, talk to us today. Thank you so much, and we look forward to hearing more about uh, DELC. Uh, beautiful. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, my dear friend Kashif. It's really a pleasure and honor for me to be with you today, and uh, um, thanks again for your kind of, uh, invitation. And um, what I think is really more impressive is to see where you are now, Kashif. It's really uh, wonderful to see precision uh, cornea and what you already started there, to see what you guys already established in the uh, Ottawa Institute, congratulations, you're doing a wonderful job. Your success uh, is reflecting to all of us and it's been always fun knowing you for the last uh, 20 years and we are looking forward for uh, long friendship as well. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I was um, honored uh, to have uh, my residency program in McGill and I did also my uh, Konya Fellowship in the University of Montreal. For you guys in Canada, I really had a wonderful time. I cannot thank you enough. And uh, I, I thought the first slide should be really to acknowledge those people who taught me every single thing I know in Konya. Uh, so on the top, uh, Dr. Michel Mabon and Dr. Hélène Boisjoli from University of Montreal. I really worked with them day to day. They were really wonderful uh, team and uh, were really kind to teach me every single thing that I know and I practice today. Uh, at the bottom as well, uh, Dr. Louis Racine and Paul Thompson from Notre Dame. I had really a wonderful time with them part-time. And uh, last but not least, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Chima, I had the part-time of the fellowship with him, but I also enjoyed working with him five years in, uh, in McGill. And uh, for all of them, really, uh, thanks a lot. I'm not sure if they are joining us, but if you guys have a chance and you catch up with them later on, send them my deepest regards. Um, now, uh, Kashif will keep it uh, uh, informal in a sense. You decide if you want to stop me at any point of time. There are a lot of slides, a lot of uh, videos. Uh, so I'll keep it in your control and you decide at any point of time, feel free to stop me. Um, I ask a question uh, for uh, Kashif team. Okay, guys, what, who's the team there and who's attending this webinar? And they told me that they, like, it's a really open uh, webinar in a sense. So there are cornea specialists, there are general ophthalmologists, there are residents, there are allies uh, joining us. So I had to structure the presentation, keeping in mind that I have this uh, general group attending this webinar. And I said, okay, you know what? Let me see how active is the anterior lamellar keratoplasty in terms of numbers in Canada. So I found this uh, statistics coming from the Canadian Eye and Tissue Banking Statistics. And basically it's showing that over at least four years, 2013 to 2016, uh, 16, every single year, the, uh, the anterior lamellar crest, uh, keratoplasty fall within 5% or less from the total cornea transplant. So that means that this procedure is possibly is not too much common there, which I understand as well, since keratoconus is not common there. So that's, again, pushing me to give some introduction at the beginning. But just to let you know on how demographics plays a role here and genetics factors, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty is like 80 to 85% of all the grafts I do. 
It's very rare for me here in the Gulf to see a case of flukes, uh, but it's more common every single day to see few new patients of keratocoids. So what we're gonna do today in terms of objectives is I'll give an introduction to the DALC, uh, just for people who did not see it before to understand what is the procedure. We will go through the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we will show a standard technique uh, just for everybody to be aware about it. And then we will take about eight scenarios that are challenging. And if you don't know what it can turn into complications, I will show some of them with the long-term results of 10 to 12 years. And then I have four or five cases that I would consider special cases that um, uh, possibly for those who are in the learning care for the DALC, it will help them to uh, learn from the experience we went uh, through at the beginning. So uh, keratoplasty now in 2020 is different than when we started, do, or at least when I started doing my cornea fellowship in 2006. Um, if you want to think about it, let's divide the cornea into two parts. So we will call the anterior part for the parts covering the epithelium, Baumann's membrane, stroma, and the posterior part of the cornea we will call for the dismet membrane, endothelium, and let's consider as well the duos layer or the predesmatic layer as part of the posterior cornea. So what's happening now in keratoplasty or in cornea transplant? If we are facing a patient who have a normal posterior cornea, like normal endothelium, then these, like for example, keratoconus in a young gentleman, then these are a wonderful cases for you to do deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Basically, you keep the posterior cornea in place and you just replace the anterior cornea. Now in Canada and Northern Hemisphere, the fuchs is very common. So you guys have a lot of pathology involving the posterior cornea, which is the dismet membrane endothelium, but on the other hand, the anterior cornea is normal, so there is no need to change the whole cornea now. And that's where it comes place for DMEC and DSEC. I hope this is a simple introduction for the idea. So in DALC, we are replacing all the anterior or we are keeping the posterior cornea, the endothelium intact. If you want to look at a gross anatomy, for example, so the part at the bottom, which is, I'm holding it with the forceps, this is the posterior cornea, if you want to imagine, this with membrane and endothelium. It's maybe more or less 5% from the corneal thickness. And the upper part, which is the anterior cornea, this is representing the 90 to 95% of the stroma, Baumann's membrane, and the epithelium. So why to bother with DALC? Why we don't do all the cases as a cornea transplant full thickness and make it easier for us? Well, there are really a true advantages for DALC. And the top of them that there is no risk of endothelial rejection. My friend, don't forget, we did not change the endothelium. We kept it intact. The other thing, obviously, even the drop of the numbers in the endothelial cell loss compared to the PKs over the years is much less. And some cases will be able to show that as well and uh, no risks of primary graft failures. One very important factor that we need to consider here that we changed the DALC, the cornea transplant from being an intraocular procedure to extraocular procedure. So basically you don't open the eye, except if you wanna do a paracentesis, which is sometimes you can bypass if you want. And this is amazing because with that, it comes decreased risk of damage to intraocular structures decreased risks of expulsive hemorrhage. And I think this is very important, especially when we are dealing with the young patients. Um, your requirements in terms of the corneal donor will be a kind of less, uh, you might be too much picky on the endothelial cells. So if you have a few cases booked and you manage to do a DALC, so for this case, you will, you will take the cornea with the lowest number of endothelium because you are replacing it with the endothelium of the patient. Uh, the wound healing certainly is faster, and for that you require possibly less time for steroids with a fewer wound complications. Beautiful. So why we are not all doing the DALC in all the countries? Because uh, partially it's a technically demanding, and there's a learning curve with a certain number of complications and challenges that really you have to be ready that you'll be encountering at one point of your career. And it requires really a longer OR time at the beginning. So you need to book at the beginning the case for 90 to, let's say one and a half to two hours. At the moment, the case usually in my hands with the 16 interrupted switches, 15 
to 60, 50 to 60 minutes. But if I encounter com complications, it might increase by 50% more or less. So let's have a pictures because I think the video will be going fast. Uh, so if you start from the top, the, um, the, uh, we do the standard steps at the beginning. So uh, we just identify where's the uh, more or less the visual axis, looking at the center of the cornea. And then at the bottom, you'll see that we are taking a pachymetry because identifying the cornea thickness is very important in such cases. Why is that? I'll show it in the next slide. And based on that, you look at your tree fine. You need to have a tree fines with control depth. Um, you will look at 80 to 90% from the cornea thickness. And this might be 300 microns, might be 350, 400. Uh, it really depends on the cornea thickness and from case to case. You cannot take one number. So in terms of procedure, once you refine the cornea to 90%, uh, then you introduce a needle connected to, a 27 gauge needle connected to a syringe filled with air, 3 cc or 5 cc, and then you inject the air. The air will go to the least resistance part of the cornea and it will push the posterior cornea, remember, which is the desmet membrane, uh, endothelium and if it's type one, then it's those layer as well. It will push it toward the iris and forming a bubble. Hence the name, the big bubble technique. So here I'm just showing that we did the trephination, you introduce the needle in the second picture. And then the third picture, once you start to uh, inject, you'll start to see the bubble formed until it reached to the edge of the trephination. Now, I will use the slide to explain a very important factor that will come later on. So if you look at the uh, lower right uh, picture, you will see a whitish band. What are the signs that will help us to identify that we, are, we had a case or we had a successful type one bubble? There are three major things that you need to consider. The first one is the uh, increase in the pressure. So if you touch the eye, you'll feel the pressure really high. Number two, the spreading circle coming from the center, usually to the periphery, and then you see the whitish band at the end. And then on the microscope, you will appreciate in 3D that the corneal dome is coming toward you. So these are three signs to help you to identify that this is type one bubble. So we'll carry on with the photos. So you remove the, you do keratectomy to remove the 80 to 90% of the uh, anterior cornea as much as you can. And then you look at the lower part uh, picture, uh, the uh, puncture of the remaining of whatever from the anterior cornea, because you want to reach the level which is separating the anterior from the posterior cornea. And here that level is appreciated with the first picture up to the left. So you move your spatula and that spatula is moving now between the anterior cornea and the posterior cornea. And then you start, start using your scissors to removing whatever remaining of the anterior cornea. By that, you will end up by the uh, lower picture, which is the exposed posterior cornea. So that means you are ready, you just get the donor, remove the endothelium from the donor. And that's what you do, you just like standard punch. The only different step here, which you are seeing on the right lower, is to remove the posterior cornea from that donor, because now you wanna apply the anterior cornea to the posterior, the anterior cornea from the donor to the posterior cornea from the recipient and is sutured in the standard way. That's my friend, the standard technique for DALC. Now, I prepared eight scenarios or questions that can be encountered during the OR. And I'll say more or less, these are the most common scenarios. And um, I'm putting them as a questions because that will help us to think together. So the first one, when you inject, sometimes you don't know what you are encountering. Is this a bubble type one or not? So that are the questions. What are the signs for the big bubble type one? And then there's another type of bubbles, which is type two described by Dr. Dua. I will be showing it because it's very important because you will encounter it at one point of time in your career. Sometimes you'll be encountering both of them. So you need to know what you are facing. So that's the third question. And sometimes you inject, you get the emphysema, the whitish in the cornea band, and then you don't know that I really get anything there or just emphysema in the cornea without separation of the anterior and posterior cornea. The fifth scenario is sometimes you inject, my friend, all the air you can inject, but there is no bubble. So what to do? And sometimes you try and you try, there's no bubble at all. So what to do? And then 
what will be the scenarios or what are the steps that should I be expecting to have a perforation? So I have a different scenarios to show a perforation for you to be ready. And then if you have a perforation, what should you do? So we'll go through these eight scenarios. And again, as I said, um, catch if you want to interrupt me at any point of time, feel free. And then I'll have a few special cases that we'll be discussing them after these eight scenarios. So let's take the first video, which is the standard technique by Anwar, since the most popular one. And we will look to see if we really encountered, in this case, type one bubble or not. So just to move faster, uh, I'm here describing that we are using uh, the tree fine to a certain depth, maybe in this case, 300, 400 micron, doesn't matter. Preparing your needle and putting a viscoelastic, that helped me as a magnifier. And here uh, I'm using a 27 gauge needle. You'll be seeing some change in the techniques. Don't forget these are videos collected over the years. And you need to start to inject there are signs that you will see. Number one, you see the bubble now started to expand. Here's the bubble and it's reaching to the end. So there are three signs, the whitish band, the pressure is high, that's why I'm doing a paracentesis to lower the pressure, and the dome of the cornea was coming, bulging forward superior toward you. Now you are supposed to remove the, uh, as much as deep you can get from the anterior cornea, 80 or 90 percent, because the thinnest part, uh, once you're trying to, to puncture, for the roof of the uh, anterior cornea, it's very important to have a thin cornea that will help you to have smooth in and out. I'm, I'm here using uh, this technique with the viscoelastic. It really works in my hand. You can only, if you want, you can slice, slice, slice it from the top. Whatever works in your hand is good. Now, as we discussed, we are just removing the remaining of the anterior cornea, uh, trying to have only the posterior cornea underneath my spatula and on top of the spatula is the remaining of the stroma. So here I'm cutting it like uh, three layers or three parts, whatever. It's, it depends really on what's your preference. And then you continue on taking the rest of the stroma. Now we have exposed posterior cornea and we'll move to the donor. So the donor is refined in the standard way that uh, uh, we are using. And then I'm here removing the posterior cornea which is the dismet membrane and the endothelium out because I only need from this donor, the anterior cornea, the stroma basically and the bomb's membrane. And this is what I'm gonna apply here on top of the patient eye of the posterior cornea. And I start suturing the cornea in the standard way. So these are the standard, or let's say standard case of DALC uh, type one bubble. And here the objective is to learn the three signs that help me to identify if I have type one or not. Now let's move to the second one. Sometimes you might encounter type two bubble and it's important to identify. So this case is for a patient that was done in 2008. At that time I was in SKMC Sheikh Khalifa Medical City. And at that time this patient was about 13, 14 years old, advanced keratoconus with a very severe burner. So I was really trying my best to get dark here. So let's start the case. And again, I'm just refining the standard way. Um, you can appreciate the corneal periphery, which is really related to the uh, very severe vernal cases. Introducing my needle, uh, trying to inject, and in this part, you will see I'm showing it to you in a slow motion. Now I see the air, and the air formed here. So obviously the first thing I thought about, that I punctured the dismet membrane, and this air is inside the anterior chamber. But in fact, I remember a presentation, which I'll discuss it later, and I found that this air is not moving. So if you move the eye, the air is concealed within the cornea itself. So that means it's not, in, it's not in the anterior chamber and it's a, actually a case of type two bubble. And that time uh, we did not know about type two bubble and I thought that this is a case of, we thought it's a this separation between the banded and non-banded zone of the dismet membrane. And that means that which is the case actually even in type two, that the posterior cornea is very thin and you have to be very careful because the chances for rupture and perforation here is very high. Uh, so I'm removing the cornea and changing my technique a little bit here. I really wanna maintain the dismet membrane for this patient uh, for the clinical condition I explained to you earlier. So slowly, slowly, and you can appreciate here even that the dismet membrane or the posterior cornea is more shiny than the standard cases you will see when you still have a predismatic layer or duos layer. So we go slowly, slowly, as much as possible, give it a time. 
and uh, I'll just go through the steps faster until we get the uh, uh, intact, uh, let's say, the uh, posterior cornea, and we then just suture as usual. Now, this is the same patient 12 years later. So that's a picture taken in 2019. He still have his cornea. He did not have a single incidence of rejection. In fact, you can see some sutures there because I already implanted toric ICL for him. He's doing very well with this eye. Now, this is a different scenario, and this is a case uh, about uh, maybe one to two years ago. So the technique is a little bit different. I, I, I now try to do, after I do my, uh, my trifonation, just a mark as much as possible at the bottom part of the trifonation, and I use the tank cannula. Uh, <clears throat> again, the viscoelastic as a magnifier for me. And I'll use the tank cannula, and there's some resistance normal until I reach to the middle. And then I will start, at that moment of time, I had actually a visitor with me inside the operating room. And um, uh, showing the, uh, assuming that this will be a type one, and here showing you guys in a slow motion. So type one is forming. And then suddenly, because it's very important, you really keep your eyes during the injection. I started to see a reflection coming from beyond the borders of the trophination. This is all in slow motion. And now we'll come back to the normal speed. So I'm explaining to him that this is type one that you are seeing here in the periphery, but we are also having type two. If you see, we did a paracentesis and then the type two is shown here. So we have two types. This is type two, which is more or less behind the, um, the duos layer and the type one, which we presume on top of the duos layer. So what we do here, again, we uh, do the standard procedure. I remove the cornea. Again, I, I puncture and understand the technique for me. I use it uh, like this mark does really help me to identify. Sometimes it's difficult to find where you puncture from. And again, I found the viscoelastic <clears throat> on top of the, um, the puncture part. It really helps you to control the air doesn't escape quickly from the cornea. Uh, after that, just passing your uh, scissors in the usual way. I'm just going to move faster. Uh, and um, so this is the whole type one is removed. You see still some air, and this air is supposedly to be behind the duos layer and on top of the dismet membrane. I felt it's a small area. That's fine. So it's okay. Let's suture. I assumed it will disappear with time, it did not. So I said, okay, let's put some um, air inside the anterior chamber. I could have opened it, but to be honest with you, I didn't want to have any perforation in this case. So, okay, let us see what happened with this one. So that's the post-op, the picture to the left. Uh, first day post-op, uh, there's still some air in the anterior chamber, and you can see that small circle, so I cannot show it with the mouse and have this kind of uh, image. Uh, the, the small air bubble still present in the lower part of the cone. But of course, with the time it disappeared, this is the, uh, the image of the same patient a few months down the road, of course, it disappeared. You still can appreciate some, I would say, um, I don't know how to describe it, if it's gonna be haze or some irregularity in the dismet membrane in that area, but really does not have any impact on the patient vision, and she's doing very well. Now, sometimes you inject and the cornea get emphysematous, white, and you don't know if this is really uh, a dalk with a bubble or just a matter of air in the stroma. And if you puncture, then you will rupture the dismal membrane and you will convert into full thickness transplant. So this is a case of um, corneal ulcer uh, that was referred to me. And after uh, treating the corneal ulcer, the patient ended up by a corneal scar. So we decided to go for this case uh, for a, um, a DALC. And I'm just gonna fast forward. So we did our trifonation and using the syringe. This case again was done, I think 2009. And uh, I saw this patient two years ago. She was doing perfectly well on this eye. So here I'm injecting. And that was in the first 50 cases of DALC. And I can see that the cornea or the yeah, the cornea bulged forward toward me, but when I'm applying some pressure on that, I really don't feel the, the firmness that usually you get when you have a successful type one bubble. You really feel the pressure like 50, 60 at that moment of time. 
but here I was not feeling it. So I decided, you know what, let me try to remove the superficial cornea and we'll try to figure if we'll inject again or not. So here what I did, actually, I did a paracentesis and I inject air. And the air, if you have a bubble, the air will not go to the center. It will stay in the periphery. And then whatever, whenever you move the air, it will stay in the circle outside the, um, the trophination. And that means that I have a bubble here. So what I did is the standard thing. I, um, I punctured the roof of the uh, anterior cornea. And I was able to pass my spatula and the faucet later on. And here the dismet membrane or the posterior cornea underneath me, removing the whole cornea. And by that, that was the end of the case. It went very well. So here, if we did not do this technique, we could have ended up by a perforation of the cone and converting to PK. So what we learned from this case, that uh, DALC of course can be done in a case is not necessarily only keratoconus, like opacities uh, and scarring, and uh, involving the anterior cornea, of course. And the second thing, we learned the technique that if you are wondering if you have a bubble or not, how to identify the presence of the bubble versus not. Now, sometimes you do the standard technique and um, so I'm gonna fast forward here. You inject and then you get this kind of emphysema. If you are not deep to 80 to 90% of the cornea in my hands, then usually what you get is basically emphysema in the upper part of the cornea, just like this air. So here I'm injecting, but I'm feeling that I'm not getting the bubble, so I stopped. It's a matter of you know judgment because I don't want to change the whole thing into white and then I don't know what I'm doing here. So I, I used the air that was spread in the cornea from the first part, but again, I'm not, because there's, there's a resistance. When you do the dalk at one point of time and you start to inject, you should be feeling some resistance at the beginning and that tells you that you are on the right track. It's a matter of, you know, a clinical sense. So what I did, okay, so what, let's remove as much as possible from this emphysema and let me try to inject here. On the microscope, I can appreciate uh, the depth. So I was using the needle. But if you don't have that kind of, let's say, trust, then what you can do is just you do a small neck in the upper cornea, put a BSS, swallow the cornea, and then inject. Because that will give you some, some corneal thickness to inject through without going through the dismet membrane. But here I carry, this is the fourth injection. And uh, you will see that here the bubble forms. So the bubble reached to the end, and you can see how much the pressure is really high. And that's what we discussed earlier, one of the signs of type one bubble. So let's move faster. So here again, we were able to puncture, and you can see the duos layer here because that's not the shiny one that we have seen when we describe type two bubble. And that's it. So what we learn from this case, that sometimes if you don't get the, 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 uh, the bubble one, uh, or the bubble to start with from the first injection, you can get it from the second, third, or fourth. And the second thing we can learn is uh, uh, whether we are using directly the needle to inject, if you are really comfortable with the depth and appreciating where's your dismet membrane. But if you are not, then what I can advise you is you do just a very small nick at the upper part, and I think it will be shown later on, a very, up, a very small nick in the upper part of the anterior cornea inject BSS by spatula to swollen the cornea, and then you can use the air to inject again, because now we have swollen cornea, so the chance to go through the dismet membrane is less. So that's what we learned from this case. Now, what if we continue to inject, and continue to inject, and then you never get the bubble? And I can tell you that in my hands, at the beginning at least, 30% of my cases, if not even more, I will never get the bubble. And I need to move to this technique. Now with more experience, I have done at least 300 DALC. I can say I will be happy and successful to get a DALC in about 80% plus of my cases. I still cannot claim 100, but at least 80 plus I can get it. So this is a scenario that at least you will encounter, especially in your learning experience, at least 30%, if not more. So let's see what to do. So this is a case, again, many years ago. So I start and I did my trephination and standard and injecting. But it's actually emphysema. 
sorry for the quality of the video it's an old video and then what i did okay let's try to inject air to see if we really get a bubble but of course the air if you see here it went to the center so here i did the other technique which is stromal hydration so i do a very small nick on the uh, in the upper part of the stroma and then i use a, ca a cannula uh, 27 or 30 and then i swallow the cornea and i start to inject air again let's see if i can get air but in fact again i was not successful that's fine because the cornea is already swollen with the bss with the air the air also will help you because it will be emphysema that will give you like a kind of uh, uh, contrast so how much deep you can go and then i'm a go uh, watch will i stop in this one because it's a, a learning experience now again i want to inject a BSS into the stroma. The two messages that I can share with you here is two things. Number one, you really need to have the stroma when you are injecting at this stage as much as closer to the dysmic membrane. So it's really a thin stroma because if you do it, the spread of the BSS will be diffuse. That's number one. Number two, which I think as well is very important and you can appreciate it here, that if you are really deep and you start to inject the, the BSS, you can develop a type 1 bubble, but not with an air, with a BSS. Let's identify that. So if you look here, you see the air that you injected initially and it was just under the dome of the cornea. Because now the dysmic membrane, I'll say the posterior cornea, is bulging toward the iris and the lens, you will see this air is pushed to the periphery, which means that we are getting an indirect way, a bubble type one, but with a BSS. So let's look now. Maybe I'll show it from here. Sorry, yes. Now I'm injecting, look at the bubbles and it starts to move to the periphery now, slowly, slowly. So that mean, good, that mean there's a space getting um, occupied in the anterior chamber. And then you continue your keratectomy. Last thing, when you are really very deep, you can just with the spatula remove the remaining of the stroma. Now, there are two ways of doing it. I, st I personally like to start from the center and going to the periphery. The reason for that is if I encounter perforation, I'm happy to have the clean, let's say, six millimeter of the central cornea, and that will be good for me, and then I will not convert to PK and I will switch on my donor. That will be good for me because the center part is really clear. There are other colleagues, very experienced, who prefer to start from the periphery. I think this is all as well, very acceptable. But from my perspective is if I encounter perforation early while I'm still cleaning the periphery of the cornea, that might challenge me to clear the central part of the cornea. So again, that's my rationale, going from the periphery to the center. And slowly, slowly, you will really appreciate that you are getting that very shiny reflection from the posterior cornea here. So you are really like a few microns on top of the doors layer. I'm fine with that, so I'll carry on. And that's the end of the case. Removing as much, as, and that will be the cornea. And if there is no air, this is really like a crystal clear cornea, I switch it. Now, the challenge in this part, when you are doing this technique, the procedure might take longer than the standard cases. So if in my hands now, if 50 to 60 minutes is for the uh, tie bone bubble uh, with 16 interrupted, I will do the same procedure with this kind of near dysmic membrane dissection. It will take 90 minutes and even more. So that's really help you when you're trying to schedule your OR and the number of cases that you are putting there. Now, a very important scenario and that I will guarantee every single one of us uh, who are starting or started DALC is a perforation. That's part of the package. No matter how skillful you are, you will really encounter perforation. The question is, when you will expect to have a perforation and what to do if you encounter perforation? So I collected a few cases from over the years with different scenarios of perforation which basically will tell you, you can get perforation at every single step of the procedure. Now, let's start the first one. This is a perforation when we are doing a trephination. So I did my calibration, but my calibration was not correct and I went through. So this is a full thickness uh, perforation for the cornea by the trephination. Sometimes you introduce your needle, 
you assume that you are like 80 to 90 percent of the cornea, but in fact, you will realize that you already went through the desmet membrane because when you inject the air, the air will go directly to the center of cornea. And now you're removing the needle, you see the fluid coming out. Uh, this is an interesting case because there are sometimes uh, a weak cornea, a weak parts of the cornea, which might push you to expect a perforation when it happened. Now, this is a case that was referred to me in 2008. The case uh, is a keratoconus for gentlemen who had uh, intracorneal ring done by intralase in 2005 by another colleague. In fact, even uh, you still see a suture here because this patient have a toric ICL. Um, the vision did not improve. So the doctor removed the toric ICL. He referred them for a transplant for me. So what I learned from this case is, again, don't forget this intralase 2005, and I don't know uh, how old the machine at that point of time, but I would expect it's not that old. Uh, since intralase starts only 2003, 2004, this is the part where the doctor uh, uh, introduced his rings, and that comes by the entralase. You will see that when I'm injecting the air, when the air comes to this part in type 1 bubble, uh, uh, the air will, 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 will perforate into the anterior chamber. So that means for me that the shots of the entralase, some of them went deep, and they cut or weaken the desmet membrane, which did not help it to control or to, uh, uh, to accept the amount of pressure going with type 1. So let's have a look now, because it's an interesting case I never encountered, except in this case, uh, that kind of scenario of ICR. So see the bubble forming now, the slow motion. Look when it comes here. Suddenly the air is going into the anterior chamber, as you can see, so I stopped. So that means I had a perforation here. I will show how to manage this case later. Now, this is a very interesting case. Again, I learned it the hard way. Uh, it goes to 2009. Two sisters I did on the same day, and I repeated the same mistake. So here what happens is I get a type 1 bubble. I see emphysema here, that's fine. So I will remove my cornea, I will puncture. Actually, I am doing a paracentesis, but during the paracentesis, you will see that the air in this part, which is the uh, in type 1, is coming forward. That means that I punctured the bubble. And this is a premature. And this is from the paracentesis. So that means that the bubble was extending to here, whether it's type 1 or 2, I don't know, but most likely 2 because of the size. And I perforated before I even start. It's still fine. I was able to remove the uh, cone and I complete as a full dark, but I did not understand the scenario. Again, I'm repeating this was in 2008. So that even before Professor Dewey to publish his paper on the test of bubble. I could have published the uh, <laughs> type 1 bubble myself if I looked at this scenario earlier, but I did not. So my friends here, I'm removing the, the cornea. I'm, I'm, I'm doing just a paracentesis, but in fact it went through, and you'll see the air here is coming because I ruptured the bubble earlier. Seems it's coming from here to this part. Or possibly it was as well from that part, I'm not sure. Now, even during the lamellar dissection, sorry for the quality, but again, this is an old video. Um, just during uh, the lamellar dissection, and you see you can puncture here. So all of these scenarios, well, even during suturing, believe it or not, sorry, believe it or not, this is a case, I'm at the end, just suturing, and um, surprisingly, I'm passing my needle, there was no perforation earlier, I'm starting to see aqueous coming from this part, which you appreciate here. So even during suturing, because if you don't take enough or you don't pay enough attention, you can even go with your needle through the dysmetic membrane. The concept of big bubble in cases of uh, weak cornea. So this is a case, I don't have the anterior segment OCT. It was done about five or six years ago. I did the pentacam and I'm seeing opacity in the cornea. I thought this opacity is not involved in the dysmetic membrane. So I attempted uh, the uh, the, uh, the, the DALC for him in the standard way. And it's very interesting. You see the bubble here is forming. I'm going very slowly. 
I just want to see that the dalk or the bubble is reaching to the end because that will make my dissection easier uh, and decrease the chance of perforation. Everything is going smooth, happy with that. So we pass the trephination borders, that's fine. Starting to remove the anterior cornea with my care. And then suddenly I appreciate that the, uh, the air starting to escape, that means I punctured the bubble. So uh, because it's a very thin cornea as I showed in the uh, Pentacam, just going from the periphery. Now what to do, should I convert, should I not? So I decided that, you know what, uh, let's accept the presence of the air here. And I will remove as much as deep as I can get from the cornea. And let's expose the central five to six millimeter from the cornea. Uh, this will be enough for me. And let's try to avoid conversion or conversion of this cornea into a full thickness. And you can see here, this is very decent to have a central five to six millimeter exposed intact very well and you will manage I, I, I can't expect the astigmatism here but that's fine I did not change the the uh, uh, the the procedure to that now where the perforation happened I'm doing it here in a slow motion you will see in a second that once the bubble expanded beyond uh, that area that whitish band which is very bright white white it will change to kind of kind of dim so that means that the dismet membrane at that point of time during the injection and not during the keratectomy it let go so i'm going to show it to you now in slow motion ah sorry uh we'll just move faster oh sorry it's in that because uh, because we already uh, jumped in the slide, I'm not able to move it. Okay. I think for the sake of time, I'm just gonna jump. Uh, Cash, if you can interrupt me at any point of time, if you want. Uh, now, how to manage perforation. Uh, let's show that case of the ICR. So here I get the bubble up to this point. And here we encounter the perforation. Should we convert? Again, I really, really hate to convert. So I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So tip number one, try to get as deep as possible in your keratectomy. Number two, you can see the bubble here reaching to this part. So I know that I have a bubble until this part here. So uh, I puncture it, the perforation is here. So I get the sealing or the perforation kind of seal. Let's remove this part and we'll keep the area of the perforation until the end. So again, going to the other part, because this is, don't forget, it's coming from the intralase. It's like a vertical cut. So if I start to remove the stroma in this part, you'll start to see or appreciate the aqueous leaking from the anterior chamber. So that's fine for me. I decided to let go and then I'll just continue as a dark and I will suture. I've seen this patient, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture for him, but I've seen him about uh, one year ago. So that's like more than 10 years from the surgery. And don't forget, I shifted my practice from uh, SKMC to a private practice. And uh, that's why I don't have all the follow-ups and he's doing excellent. Oh, so the question, Saleh, why you really care about that? Because here in UAE and in the Middle East, we have a lot of cases uh, or chances of uh, rejection. And uh, that's really very common, whether it's coming from genetic, whether it's coming from uh, compliance with medications, to be honest with you. And um, it really pushed me toward trying and attending DALC for every single case until I really, really cannot do, and then I'll convert. So let me share with you a few cases that I believe they are special cases that can put you really into complications. And I can share a few tips that can help you uh, to bypass this experience. So DALC and uh, post ICR. So I find DALC and ICR is relatively, it's kind of common because you'll see a lot of cases that had ICR did not improve enough and then they will come for transplant. Uh, my advice here and the key word that uh, really make me happy because I already have the ring done by the intralase or whatever thing to second and most of the cases at already 80% of the corneal thickness if not more. So I got already my identified part for introducing the needle or the cannula at the proper depth. So let me show it in this case. So this is a case that I done about a year ago. 
That's my case. I did the ring. The patient did not improve on the side. So I'm using a, a barren tree fan in this case. And here, when I'm doing the cut, I don't care about the tree finishing of 70%. That's enough. But I'm looking where is the posterior part of the ring because that identifies for me the 80 to 90% of, uh, of the depth of the colon. And introducing from there, the, uh, in this case, I'm using a tank cannula and uh, slowly, slowly injecting in the standard uh, technique. Let's go a little bit faster. Yes. So you see here the bubble formed and uh, that's the it. And actually it went really beyond even the trephination and uh, the rings in place. So simply here, you just remove your rings the standard way and uh, the case continue as usual. Nothing challenging. So that's my tip. In cases of rings, uh, you can use the depth of the ring to guide you for your, your, uh, your introduction for the, uh, um, uh, for the needle or the cannula. Now, uh, sometimes in cases of uh, dystrophies, uh, this is a case who had a LASIK. It's, it's again done about uh, 11 years ago. This I believe in 2009. Uh, I don't recall to be honest what was the dystrophy. It's granular macular. It looks for me granular kind of. Anyways, with the LASIK flap, it was done elsewhere. I don't have the file for this patient, but I have as a follow-up because he showed up to me recently in the private sector. So I'm injecting here. Uh, this is the LASIK flap, and I'm not getting the bubble, so that's fine. Faster, and I'm going from the other side, and from that part, I was able to get uh, my bubble, and uh, forming the uh, type 1 bubble in this case, of the CS. So you see here the pressure and expanding of the uh, circle until the end. So here we are good. We do the keratectomy in the usual way, puncture the roof of the bubble, and removing the stroma. Now, the other thing you'll start to see here, you used to appreciate the depositions of the uh, dystrophy on the uh, posterior part of the cornea. That really puts a question. Saleh, do you think DALC is better for these cases? Or should you have just, because of the presence of these depositions, directly to the PK? Well, let's share the experience with the time because that will really help us. So this is a video, just fast forward. This patient uh, showed to my clinic a few months ago. He already had, we did the left eye, this is the right eye. He already had two corneal transplant full thickness done by a colleague elsewhere in the last five years with a cataract surgery and toric IOL and already a recurrence of the dystrophy in the new cornea. Let's have a look. So this is a full thickness transplant. The patient already had a cataract surgery done and you appreciate the recurrence of the dystrophy in the new full thickness transplant. Now let's look at the eye we did, which is the left eye. It will come now. Yeah, here's it. Yes, there is a recurrence of the dystrophy. I appreciate that in the central part. And here, the patient was not followed with me for at least 10 years. It seemed that he was wearing a contact lenses. I don't think the fitting was proper. And you appreciate this is a lipid deposition coming from corneal vascularization that you will appreciate during the examination. Let's have a look. So here's the recurrence, and here's the uh, lipid deposition in the periphery. Here's the recurrence in the central part, and here's the uh, deposition in the periphery, so it's not involving the axis or the visual, center or visual axis. And you will appreciate it's coming from the blood vessels here. And from the history, it, it seems to me it's referring to the contact lens that he is wearing or he used to wear. Now, Let's have a look at the specular microscopy. So the upper one is the DALC eye. This is the left eye, which we really did about uh, 2009. And the endothelial cell count still 2,500. The lower, part, the lower picture is for the specular microscopy of the second full thickness transplant, and it's already 517. So, in my point of view, that's a good example that uh, for you or for whoever is starting, if you can manage to do it, the chances for you to maintain this cornea is longer. So this patient now, he will require a new transplant in the left eye. That's fine. I will show a case of repeat that. We'll just remove that cornea, put the new one and switch it. 
and look at the specular microscopy. And believe it or not, until this moment, the patient appreciate the vision quality from this eye better, the dark eye better than the PK. However, this one case, but it does, at least it gives us a sense that there's a place in case of corneal dystrophies. Now, in case of lattice dystrophy, this is a lady that, again, I did this, I believe, in 2010. And I did her in SKMC. It's a case of lattice dystrophy, and you can appreciate the, the positions there. So uh, let's carry with the case. Again, uh, injecting the air. I appreciate the starting of forming a bubble, but it's not really, uh, the, uh, let's say, the resistance that I'm expecting. So I'm going here, injecting, and I appreciate type 2 bubble, if you see it in that part. Okay, good. But again, don't forget this really even before the uh, dual layer publication, whatever. So I'm expecting that this is between the two layers of the dysmic membrane. Let me confirm that. I don't know really what's the extension. So I'll do a paracentesis, injecting some air. Again, the air is going to the periphery if, when I move the uh, cornea or the eye. Good. So that means I have some sort of a bubble here. So I puncture it, and now I appreciate the air. Now the air you see coming from the periphery of the cornea to the center because the bubble already punctured and the air is moving forward or upward. What I did here is a paracentesis. Keep this thing in your mind because again, I thought this is a very fragile cornea. I wanna remove any air that's in the anterior chamber as much as possible. And you can appreciate the uh, smoothness of this kind of bubble. Here, when I'm removing the remaining of this patella at the stroma, you appreciate some fluid here, which is very thin. Don't forget, this is coming in the area of the paracentesis. Now, uh, that's just suturing the cornea in the standard way, nothing different, there's no leak. And then in the post of day one, I have here a case of dismant membrane detachment. So, uh, uh, did you talk to me, Kashif? I did not hear you. No, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that maybe we'll, uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, start answering questions. Okay. But uh, I'd I like Fine. to I'd like, go ahead. Please finish this segment here. Right. So this segment. is a case of dysmal membrane detachment. And you can see the blue arrow uh, identifying where's the detachment. And I think it was coming from the area of the paracentesis. I'm not sure if I created false track with that paracentesis, but that was a theory. So I'm going to show you here the standard way of managing a dysmal membrane detachment. So the first thing is you need to identify where you're gonna do your paracentesis because it's very important to go from an area where you're really sure 100% that the dysmic membrane is intact. So that's number one. Number two, you need to remove some aqueous from the anterior chamber before you inject your air. Whether to go with air, sex, this is your call. And then the third thing is, uh, I form just a, like a large bubble, just a standard one in cases of uh, D sick or whatever. But what I can help you here that there is a ventic incisions already available for you. So if you just pass your speak, your uh, between the two edges of the transplant, you will be able to remove the fluid that's available behind your donor. And this is the uh, picture of the patient post-op uh, day one and the cone is recovered beautifully. Now, for this patient, her specular microscopy, again, 10 years after the transplant is 1354, and she is doing very well, but of, there's a recurrence in this eye, and I expect this patient that will require a new DALC in her eye within a year. Last thing that I want to show, and I can go faster, because this is the only repeat DALC I did in my 13 years of experience with DALC. So that tells you within a 30, 300 cases, at least that I have done, only one case, at least in my hand that came back to my follow-up, maybe some patients went to another practice, that's possible, but that tells you how very uncommon for you to do a repeat DALC. So this patient, um, I did that DALC for her, she did extreme, 2015, she did extremely well, within three to four weeks, she, dis she was reaching 2020 with a very small refractive error. I was extremely happy for her. And then she decided for some reason to stop her steroids between herself uh, without coming back to us. So when she came to us, the suture was already loose. It was like maybe five, six weeks after the transplant, three weeks without uh, any steroids, cornea vascularization everywhere. 
So we spend about one year, maybe even more, myself and Dr. Saadi trying to control the blood vascularization until we come to a decent, let's say, level of vascularization. Now it's referred. So that was the area of vascularization. I'm going to show you the transplant. So what I learned from this case, that the cornea and dalk, the healing, is very, very, very strong. I'm just going fast here, guys, because it's difficult to identify. Look what I'm trying to pull this trauma. Very, very tight adhesions. That really tells you the kind of wound healing that you expect with that. Look, look, look here. Now, this is the dismal membrane. And see how tough it is to remove the cornea, the donor. And it will go on and on. Every single part, it's really, really difficult. Uh, without exaggeration, maybe 15 minutes just to be able to remove the donor. So I'll go faster. And here the area that was a vascularization because it was already scarred. The second thing I learned, of course, in the area of scarred, the tissue, if you remove the donor, it might go into the recipient. So you have to be careful here because it's thin scarred. So I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna say, you know what, let's go from the other side. And then I'm just gonna cut, otherwise I'm really going into the recipient. This is a scarred tissue. So go faster. I know I'm running. Okay, so cutting the donor. But look at the posterior cornea, just as you finished the first case. Long story short, this patient did extremely well. For six months, we removed all the sutures. She had three diopter stigmatism, 2020, very happy. Guess what happened? Again, she stopped the steroids and disappeared on us for eight months. And the blood vessel came back again to the same area. With the steroids now, it regressed. She came back to the 2020 with her refractive error. But that just tells you some patients, they don't live up there. And she's about 35. Anyways, that will be my last slide. Thank you. And I'm open. This is the patient after the transplant to the right. And the second transplant, she's doing as I explained earlier. Thanks for your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Nice, very nice overview. Uh, we have a few questions, if you have a few moments. Um, uh, one question is, I would like to ask about the role of fibrin glue over the area of decimase membrane microperforation or macroperforation. And if Dr. Um, Saleh has any experience with it. Okay. Well, I think this is a very, very good question. Yes, there are colleagues who reported using the fibrin glue in that area. And in my hands, I did not need to use it uh, because usually with managing the air inside the anterior chamber, I really did not, at this stage at least, until this stage, I did not need to use it. But there are colleagues who are reporting using it. And if it's uh, reasonable, not in the center, they did very well with that. But okay. not in my hands. I did not try it myself. How about uh, patients who've had previous history of high drops? What is your approach? Yes. Well, uh, this is a very uh, good question as well. Uh, two things. Uh, at least in my, uh, in my hands, I need to consider a few things. Uh, number one, is this opacity really in the central uh, or it is a little bit decentered? Is that patient, patient that can really ex can be compliant with my medications and will be really following up properly, or it's like kind of a bit one patients that you might do the surgery and disappear on you for one year, which sometimes does happen in my practice. So if this patient is reliable, I will attempt to do kind of near this membrane dissection. If I can get a proper depth to the cornea and there is no scarring in the central, I'll be happy with that. But to be honest with you, if it's central and I don't expect that even going deep, the opacity will completely dissolve. There is nothing bad about doing the full thickness transplant. Okay. Um, but I have to acknowledge some colleagues report on that and they are doing great, but I'm just reporting in my hands and in my experience. Okay. okay. And then when you have, um, you've used the, the cannula and you've used the 27 gauge needle with bevel down, do you have a preference right now uh, as to which way you would introduce, uh, what, what instrument you would use to initiate the big bubble? Yes, well, to be honest with you, I, I lean more toward the cannulas now. It doesn't mean the needle was bad, but my chances for perforation, I mean perforation going to, by the needle through the stroma to the anterior chamber is higher with the uh, needle versus the cannula. So my preference now 
Yes, it's the it's the cannula, not the needle. So um, again, for post-operative uh, issues, now we have some, you know, residents and uh, techs and optometrists. What is given that there's fewer episodes of, of rejection after doubt? What is your steroid um, plan after surgery? Okay. Well, I, I can share here a different experience, which is coming from the part or the time I spent in Canada versus here. I think there is a genetic factors, possibly environmental. So when we have rejection here, usually it's kind of aggressive. So, of course, I only see stroma if I see a rejection, and uh, I have seen it in a few cases. Uh, luckily, I did not at, until this stage. I did not need to regraft a patient for uh, just pure stroma rejection. They respond well with the steroids, but I treat them aggressively. So I yes, I give uh, systemic steroids, prednisone. It depends on the weight of the patient, but maybe 50 to 60 for three days. And I covered, of course, with Lozic for about five to six days. I give heavy steroids to operate for uh, every one hour while the patient awake until I see really a uh, shifting in the clinical picture. And then I start to taper. But the, the answer or the main point here, yes, you still expect to see some sort of rejections with the DALC, of course, much less than PKs, but you still should be expecting that. And don't forget to keep in mind as well herpes. Sometimes it presents in an image that you know can confuse you as well with the transplant if it's a rejection or not. So then long term after doubt, are your patients on a steroid drop once per day or you, do you stop it completely, no. completely at a certain point? Well, to be honest with you, I spoke to some of my colleagues who practice in, let's say in Europe and Northern Hemisphere. Guys, I think that the rejection in the Northern Hemisphere as much less than in our countries. So you will find some colleagues stop usually the steroids within six months. I tried that and I started to have more cases of stroma rejection. So my standard procedure is I start from the six to the 12 months into tapering the steroids. And after that, by 12, usually I already stopped the whole complete of the pret fourth. And by that time, usually I already removed most of the sutures and not all of them. I, when, I, when I remove the sutures, I give the patient as well another course of short steroids because as you know, sometimes when you do new procedure like removing sutures or doing AK uh, by femtosecond, you can induce uh, stroma rejection. So uh, that I keep in my mind. Okay, and then uh, one last question. Um, what uh, should we look as, you know, techs or residents, what should we be looking for early post-operative period? You mean, you mean early first week, first month, first six first, months? Say, first uh, week after DALC surgery. Okay. Well, of course, number one is you want to make sure that you don't have a double anterior chamber or dysmic membrane detachment. Mm -hmm. Because usually, if you see it, usually in most of the cases, 99% it will be in post-op day one. So that's the most important thing. What can help you as well to identify that if you cannot really see it clearly is to consider anterior segment OCT. Uh, number two, usually the leak is not an important factor here because it's, especially if there's no perforation, it's only through the side port of any. Uh, and you monitor your epithelial uh, closure because usually it will take about seven days to close the epithelium. You wanna make sure that all the sutures are properly buried and that's usually something you'll appreciate in the first post-operative day. Uh, by that, usually in one week to 10 days, most of the patients, they have the epithelium closed. I keep, by the way, a bandage contact lens in the first few days, and I removed in the second visit. And by that, usually the epithelium closed. Uh, one, uh, one tip here, sometimes you might have delayed epithelial healing in cases of dark, uh, maybe sometimes even more than a PK, and that will happen in the first two to three weeks. So with that, of course, you need to be very aggressive with your top, with your um, lubrication, preservative-free. Uh, lower the steroid in a sense, so maybe go to once or twice a day until you close the epithelium, and then you can raise it up again to four times a day, that's fine. Uh, because this is really something, I would say relatively common, you will see, which is delayed closure. Again, you need to monitor, don't forget patients are on steroids, so always in every visit, especially after the first two weeks, Keep the intraocular pressure in your mind. He might spike at any point of time, so it's a steroid responsive, not necessarily in the first two weeks. And uh, that's the standard thing. So that follow-up, to be honest with you, is much, much better than a follow-up for PKs. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Sally, you continue to uh, teach me. Uh, at first, you know, in the early years when you were a senior resident, you taught me how to uh, wash cars properly, polish your shoes, and press your clothes. But, uh, <laughs> of course, you're an ongoing teacher, and this has been very informative. So thank you so much for your time and your, um, and your insight on Dal. Thanks, Kasia, for inviting me again, my friend. It's been a pleasure, and uh, it's really knowing you for the last 20 years is one of the best uh, memories I carried from my experience with you guys in Canada. You are a wonderful colleague and a wonderful mentor. I hate to say that, but you are really a mentor for me now, uh, although you started as my junior, but don't forget I was your senior at one point of time, but you are my mentor now. <laughs> All the best, my dear. Keep doing the great job you are doing now. Send my regards to every single colleague you see, guys, in, uh, in uh, McGill, in Montreal, and everywhere in Canada. And okay. thanks again for inviting me. Thank you, Sana. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Pleasure. You take care. Bye-bye.